In 2010, we finished off Heart Gold and Soul Silver with quite the set. Heart Gold Silver Triumphant is one of the greatest sets of all time, with tons of very, very good cards. Since it is a Heart Gold and Soul Silver set, most of those cards are unfortunately featured exclusively in the trainers and ultra rares. However, these trainers and ultra rares were so good that it's worth making a video just about this set. But first, let's talk about the non ultra rare cards that happen to see some play. Banette from Triumphant is an interesting card because of its Lost Crush attack, which can Lost Zone and Energy on a coin flip from one of your opponent's Pokémon. The second attack is pretty much irrelevant, and we're here for the first attack. What this was able to do is, under Item Lock from Vileplume at the time, you could potentially run your opponent out of energy completely, since they would not be able to recover it with traditional means such as using Super Rod, which came out a couple sets after uh, Triumphant. So your opponent could potentially run out of energy, but strategies like these are always pretty gimmicky. Regardless, there was some decks that played this Banat, since it is a very unique and powerful effect. The Ditto Balak Ditto is one of many Dittos, and while it's not the best Ditto in the world, it has some use because of its ability Ditto Balak, which reduces the bench size of both players down to four. Obviously, it only reduces your opponent, but since you have to also play Ditto, you're essentially at four yourself. This card was not as good as the Roadblock Pseudo-Wudo with the same ability since it wasn't around at the same time as the Skyfield Stadium, but every once in a while a deck that wants to play Ditto would pop up and use it. The Top Burner Meg Mortar was a fun rogue strategy, which used Top Burner for each Fire Energy attached to Meg Mortar, discard the top card of your opponent's deck. Then you flip a coin of Tails, discard all energy attached to Meg Mortar. The goal was to deck your opponent out with this attack. It was very gimmicky at first, but in the 2011 season, once the post-rotation happened and the Ambor from Black and White released, we got the chance to use Top Burner more effectively, since Embor could accelerate as many fire energy you like during your turn from your hand. This Embor would then pile on the energy to a Pokemon like Shuckle promo card to draw as many cards as possible before the energy could be picked up once again and put onto Magmortar, allowing for the combo to work much more smoothly. This is never more than a gimmick deck though, since the decks of the time that were powerful and fast could just run through Magmortar before it could deck them out. Weirdly enough, Bellsprout is a very notable card from the set for its place in the Mew Lock decks. These decks would use Item Lock from Vileplume and Mew Prime, which could copy the attacks of Pokémon in the Lost Zone to trap the opponent and then spread or remove their resources slowly over time while they're trapped from Item Lock. Bellsprout is an important part of the deck because its inviting scent is able to gust up a benched Pokémon into the active spot, but is also notable for being a basic Pokémon for a single colorless energy, meaning you didn't have to put it into the Lost Zone to use this attack easy. You would have to, of course, retreat the Bellsprout in and out of the active if you want to use it, but any steps to help the Mew Lock deck work better worked good for helping Mew actually control the opponent. This was a part of most Mew Lock decks since it was just low cost, easy to use, but Mew Lock was never a super popular strategy. Maybe the strangest card that saw play here was the Marowak, which has two fighting attacks, and fighting type is basically all it's got. Bone Rang does 60 for each heads on two coin flips, and Bone Impact can do 80 and discard a stadium in play. Um, well, these are very mediocre attacks. It's mainly because of the fighting typing in a field full of Darkrai that allowed this card to see a small amount of success. I believe top 128 in US Nats in 2012 because Darkrai was everywhere, but realistically in a competitive meta, this card is not doing too much. Just use Terrakian instead. Sharpedo is maybe the most interesting uh, regular card from the set. It was used for its Strip Bear attack, which did 20, and you flip two coins, if both of them are heads, you discard all cards from your opponent's hand. Um, the goal of this deck was to just discard your opponent's entire hand and then just whittle them away with other dark attackers, but also Sharpedo with some additions like special darkness energy to boost your damage by 10 would do 30 with Strip Bear, and you could start whittling away at the opponent. These kind of all or nothing gimmick decks, though, really aren't successful, um, and only saw, I believe, one top 128 US Nats placement from 2011. Um, it's really all that it ever did. Later on, it did get the Victini from Noble Victories, which allowed you to reflip the coin flips of any of your attacks once per turn, but still, it was never good enough to be a meta deck. 
Moving on to the trainers, we have Black Belt, which saw some play, especially when Versus Seeker was still around that could reuse supporter cards from the discard pile. Black Belt allows you to be only used if you have more prize cards remaining than your opponent, but your attacks do 40 more damage during the turn. I remember this being very good in Regigigas decks at the time, since Versus Seeker was played in those decks to reuse supporter cards, and in a pinch, doing 40 extra damage would allow you to get knockouts you otherwise shouldn't have. Since you were usually behind anyway while setting up, Black Belt was a great supporter to put in these types of slow setup decks. The opposite of slow and setup based, we have Junk Arm, the trainer card that discards two cards from your hand and searches your discard pile for a trainer card. In this time, trainer cards were referring to item cards. You show it to your opponent and put it into your hand. This is one of the best item cards of all time, since it was able to turn all of your other items into toolboxable pieces that you can get back at any time. This was played a little bit when it first released, alongside cards like Regigigas, as previously mentioned, and Gyarados, since these Pokémon heavily benefited from discarding effects, but come the mid-season rotation that would occur in 2011, getting rid of all of the Diamond and Pearl and Platinum cards, we would see Junk Arm take off, being a staple in nearly every single deck until it rotated following the 2012 World Championships. Junk Arm was really everything since it allowed powerful item cards like Pokemon Catcher and Dark Patch as well as switching cards and as well as random receiver to find your supporter cards and versus seeker to also find supporter cards. There was really no deck that couldn't take advantage of Junk Arm if it wanted to, besides maybe the item lock decks. Seeker was a very unique supporter card that made each player return one of his or her benched Pokémon and all cards attached to their hand. This was especially good at the time when Uxie from Legends Awakened was still legal in the format, since Uxie could be put back down and use its setup to draw more cards. We also saw it paired with Pokémon like Mesprit from Legends Awakened, which also had a play down Poké Power that could be used to shut down your opponent's Poké Powers repeatedly with Seeker picking it up. We later saw Seeker return in the Noble Victories format in a big way because of the new Electrode Donk decks. These decks would take advantage of Electrode Prime to accelerate energy to play, and then they would start sweeping the opponent's board with powerful basic attackers. Seeker was big in these decks because if you could hit your opponent with an early Seeker, sometimes you would remove their only other Pokémon on board, allowing your Pokémon to take a knockout on their active and win the game immediately. With any playdown ability, Seeker gains lots of potential, however it wasn't a staple in every deck since its effect is so situational. Regardless, it's definitely worth mentioning and it's a really fun supporter card that I'd love to see again. Maybe the best supporter card from the set is Twins. You can only use Twins if you have more prize cards remaining than your opponent, but it allows you to search any two cards from the deck. You better believe that Twins was played in every single slow setup deck, including the 2011 Worlds winning Magnavor deck, as well as The Truth, which took second place in 2011, which heavily relied on Twins to find its very hard to find cards like Rainbow Energy, Double Colorless Energy, and the Ente Suicune Legend card. Later in Twin's lifespan, we'd see it used in Chandelure decks in the Noble Victories format. Basically any Vileplume deck, rather, would love to use Twins, since they could go behind in prize cards while setting up, and set up their multiple Stage 2s to win the game. We saw Twins also used in aggressive decks, with the Electrode Prime decks previously mentioned able to knock out Electrode and give up a prize, before activating Twins to get any two cards they want from the deck. For the entire time Twins was around, the slow decks in the format were always using Twins. Thankfully it's not around today, because I feel like Control might be a little too good with Twins in the format. Lastly, for the non-ultra-rare cards of this set, we have Rescue Energy. Rescue Energy is a colorless energy that, when attached, if they're knocked out by damage from an attack, you get to put the Pokémon it's attached to back into your hand. This was really big in the 2011 World Championship format, as there wasn't any cards like Super Rod, so you had to rely on the Unreliable Revive, or you could just use Rescue Energy as your way to get Pokémon back played a big role in Reshiflosion decks especially, as those decks needed to chain six Reshirams repeatedly to make it as hard as possible for the opponent to win the game. So Rescue Energy was needed since you can only play four Reshiram in your deck. Moving on to the Pokémon Prime of the set, you'll be glad to know that every single one of the set was at least somewhat playable. Probably the least of them though is Absol, which saw use for its Eye of Disaster, which as long as Absol was your active Pokémon, when your opponent plays a basic Pokémon from their hand to the bench, put two damage counters on it. 
Amsel Prime was used in the primetime archetype with Magnazone, Yanmega, and Kingdra. This top 16 list and top 8 list from seniors was super good using Absol and pivot cards to make sure you could get Absol into the active while you were setting up, making it difficult for your opponent to play down Pokemon as they would then fall into range of Yanmega's attacks. Unfortunately, Absol's attack is not very good, so these decks didn't even focus on using it. Regardless, even for the least playable of the primes we're going to talk about today, top 16 and top 8 in Seniors of Worlds are pretty strong accomplishments to boast about. While it took a while to take off, Celebi Prime would end up becoming one of the best cards in the set in the last minutes of its lifespan. This is because in 2012's Next Destiny set, two cards released that paired perfectly with Celebi to make it a top meta threat mainly Mewtwo EX, which needed extra energy to be attached to it, and the Sky Arrow Bridge, which allowed Celebi to retreat for free. Mewtwo EX's attack was based on energy, so we need more energy. How do we get that? With Celebi's Forest Breath, which accelerated a grass energy from the hand of Celebi's your active Pokémon to one of your Pokémon. This allowed you to chain Mewtwo's more consistently than the other Mewtwo variants, which had to rely on Stage 1 Pokémon like Electric to get Lightning Energy on Benched Mewtwo. While it took a long time to catch on, Celebi made up for lost time, with CMT being a top deck going into the 2012 World Championships, even taking top 8 in the Masters division. We've mentioned him a few times already, but let's talk about Electrode Prime. Electrode Prime had the Energy Might Poke Power, which lets you look at the top 7 cards of your deck, choose as many energy as you like there, and attach them to your Pokémon in any way you like, and then Electrode is knocked out. Unfortunately, this does give up a prize card, though as we mentioned, that allows you to use the Supporter Card Twins, if you like. Electrode was used in a bunch of different decks. At first, it was used with Magnazone in a Turbo Magnazone deck that let you accelerate a bunch of energy in the play, which Magnazone could then move around with its Level X card, or discard with Magnazone Prime. Later on in its lifespan, we saw Electrode be used in basic box decks in the Noble Victory Cities format, where it powered up powerful attackers like Landorus from Noble Victories, Cobalion from Noble Victories, Terrakian from Noble Victories, and Kiram from Noble Victories. Even in the last stints of its life, Electrode still saw some play, taking top 16 at Canadian Nationals with a big basic deck of fighting attackers like Landorus and Terrakion, powered up to defeat the evil Darkrai EX. Electrode is an all-or-nothing card, because sometimes energy might just gets you no energy, but when it does get you some cards, it's quite the powerful energy acceleration engine. When Gengar Prime released, there was a panic thinking that it was going to take over the game, since the Lost World Stadium card would allow you to win the game if your opponent had six Pokémon in the Lost Zone, which Gengar happily put there. In reality, that never came to be, as Lost Guard was just a decent Tier 2 deck in different formats, but it is still a very cool card. The Catastrophe Pokebody says that as long as Gengar is your active Pokemon, if your Pokemon will be knocked out, put that into the Lost Zone. This is actually great as you can put Pokemon into the Lost Zone, meaning they can't recover them. Its main use was the Hurl into Darkness attack, which could look at your opponent's hand and choose a number of Pokemon you find there and put them into the Lost Zone. Unfortunately, this took multiple energy to find multiple Pokémon, and the opponent could always play cards like Pokémon Communication to put Pokémon back into the deck, meaning it was difficult to get Gengar to work, meaning you had to pair it with a card like Item Locking Vileplume to stop your opponent from putting Pokémon back into the deck. Thankfully, Gengar had another good attack with the Curse Drop attack, which put four damage counters on your opponent's Pokémon in any way you like. This attack was so good that Mew Prime loved to put Gengar Prime into the Lost Zone to copy its attacks, since Curse Drop would allow it to spread damage counters on the opponent's field and slowly build up enough damage to take six prizes all at once. While it never became the game-ending, scariest card in the format, Gengar Prime is a very cool card that used the Lost Zone engine to full effect. Machamp Prime has to go down as one of the coolest fighting attackers we've ever seen. When it released, it still had the partner of the Stormfront Machamp, which had the Takeout, which instantly KO'd basic Pokémon, so it slotted in perfectly as a way for Machamp to now take out Evolution Pokémon too. Not even they were safe from the powerful Champ attacks. Its Fighting Tag was a really cool Poké power, which allowed you to move all fighting energy to it and switch it with your active Pokémon. 
This meant that once your Machamp from Stormfront had done its job in taking out basic Pokemon, it was time to tag in your Machamp from Triumphant, which had powerful attacks that could take out Evolution Pokemon, such as its Crushing Punch, which did 60 and discard a special energy attached to the defending Pokemon, which is quite a powerful attack that hit weakness against powerful Pokemon like Luxray GL level X. It also had the Champ Buster attack, which did 100 plus 10 for each damage counter on each of your benched Pokemon. It wasn't the best attack in terms of adding up more damage with the effect since there was no good way to trigger it, but it was still a powerful attack. I say there's no way to trigger it, of course, until the rotation happened, and now Machamp paired well with Don Fan Prime going into the 2011 World Championships in a deck called Don Champ. Don Fan Prime would use its Earthquake attack, which did 60 and 10 to all of your benched Pokémon, to set up damage in the early game and take fast knockouts, and then you would tag in Machamp with the Fighting Tag Poké Power to start using Champ Buster for an unbelievable amount of 140 to 150 damage since all of your benched Pokémon would have damage counters on them now. While Machamp Prime was never at the top of the meta per se, it was always great alongside both Machamp from Stormfront and Don Fan Prime, until of course Mewtwo EX came out and made powering up attackers like Machamp on a stage 2 with 4 energy that are weak to psychic a little bit too much to go through. Still, it's quite the legacy to have. Arguably the best of the primes from the set is Magnazone, with its magnetic draw that let you draw until you have 6 cards in your hand, and the Lost Burn attack, which lost on as many energy attached to your Pokémon as you like, and did 50 for each one you've done. Now just for reference, Lost Burn was reprinted as an attack on Blacephalon GX, and as Mind Blown, it still had the modifier of 50 times 8 years later. So you can imagine that still having that modifier on Magnazone in a much less power crep format was very powerful. Immediately out of the gate, it paired well with the Stormfront Magnazone, which would accelerate energy into play to Lost Burn Away with Super Connectivity. We also saw it paired with Magnazone Level X, which was still out of the time, which allowed you to get rid of your debilitating fighting weakness, if you so choose, and also gave you great attacks like the Cyber Shock to instantly paralyze and the Electric Trans to move energy around your board. Later into Magnazone's lifespan, it would get even better, going into the 2011 season with the mid-season rotation. With its Diamond and Pearl Stormfront Magnazone friends gone, it had to adapt to new surroundings, but it did so incredibly, becoming arguably the best decks in the format, and in fact becoming multiple of the best decks in the format. The first was the Primetime deck, which used Magnazone, Yen Mega, and Kingdra as a triplet of powerful Prime cards with consistency, quick attacks, and utility. Magnazone was here, of course, for its magnetic draw to help you set up your board, get your Yen Mega to be able to attack for free, and for Lost Burn, of course, to take out anything that Yen Mega couldn't. The other deck that Magnazone saw play in at this time was the 2011 World's Winning Magna Board deck. This is a more simple approach to the archetype, pairing Embor in the deck to attach as many fire energies as you like to your Pokémon for Lost Burn damage, and having the Rayquaza and Deoxys Legend, which could take extra prizes with its Space Virus Poké body to finish out the game. While many primes got slowly power crept out of the format by powerful new black and white basic attackers, this wasn't the case for Magnazone, which was still viable going into the Noble Victories format, since it paired well with the brand new Electric that came out, which put extra lightning energy on your board, and Magnazone loved having efficient attackers like Zekrom around as well. Once the EXs came out, Magnazone had a much harder time keeping up, but this didn't mean it was gone. It still saw some play, such as at US Nats, where it took a one top 128 spot. Able to one-hit KO Pokémon EX with its Lost Burn attack, Magnazone was down, but not out. It really is one of the best primes, and this can be seen in the fact that it stayed around to hang with the big new basics that gave all the other primes a run for their money. Chances are that if you've played the 2011 World Championship format, you know all about Yen Mega since it's maybe the most iconic Pokémon of the format. While it was only really around for this format in its prime, pun intended, it was a great Pokémon in so many different decks that it has to be talked about. Yen Mega has the great Insight Poké Body, which if you matched hand sizes with your opponent, Yen Mega's attacks would all be free. It had two great attacks with Lanier Attack to snipe 40 damage and Sonic Boom to do 70 damage, which is not affected by weakness or resistance. Maybe Yen Mega's best attribute besides this was its free retreat, which let it pivot around the field repeatedly. 
It also had a handy fighting resistance for Donphan Prime, which was popular at the time. Yenmega loved sniping benched basic Pokémon, and in the primetime deck we talked about earlier, Kingdra could put damage on Pokémon as well with its Spray Splash to set up a Pokémon to be linear attacked for 50 damage, which KO'd most basic Pokémon at the time. Well, Yenmega usually couldn't carry the heavy loading by itself, that's why it usually paired with Pokémon that did, such as Magnezone Prime, which previously mentioned, as well as Donphan Prime and Zoroark in the famous Stage 1 stack, which Kyle Sukovich took to Nationals that year. Yenmega also saw play in its own spreading deck with Kingdra, using Jirachi from Unleashed to eventually devolve all of your opponent's Pokémon in play at once, once the damage had been set up on their board. With Judge and Copycat both legal at the time that Gen Mega was, Insight was pretty easy to get off, especially if you had Magnezone Prime in your deck to draw you extra cards. Gen Mega was a staple of the 2011 world format, and while it definitely got power creeped by the big basics of the black and white era, it's still one of the coolest cards we saw in its entire era. We've talked about Mew Prime a couple of times, but let's get to it fully now. Mew Prime used its Lost Link Pokebody, copy the attacks of Pokemon in the Lost Zone, both yours and your opponents, but usually just yours. You'd use the Relicanth from the set, which put a card from your hand in the Lost Zone and drew three cards, or Mew's Sea Off attack, which also just put a Pokemon in the Lost Zone, to get your Pokemon into the Lost Zone. Then there was a million and one ways to play Mew, but let's talk about the most successful ones. I talked previously about the Mew Lock deck, and while it definitely wasn't as successful as the other variants, it was really cool. You'd use attacks like Mux Sludge Drag, and other controlling attacks such as Bell Sprouts Inviting Scent to bring Pokémon into the active spot, and then trap them there infinitely. You could use attacks like Crocorock's Torment to prevent them from attacking, or mainly you'd use attacks like Gengar's Curse Drop to spread damage counters once your opponent can't escape the active spot. This was all aided, of course, by Vileplume's item lock, meaning they couldn't use switching trainer cards. Initially, though, Mew was actually best with Gyarados from Stormfront. Gyarados had the Tail Revenge attack, which did 90 damage if you had three Magikarps in the discard pile, which was usually your max damage. But with Mew able to see Gyarados off into the Lost Zone, you'd now be able to copy Tail Revenge and have four Magikarps in the discard pile, since you didn't need to attack with Gyarados anymore, hitting for 120 damage. This is a highly successful deck in the Majestic Dawn to Call of Legends era. Mew also loved pairing with Gengar, since the Gengar Prime deck didn't love having to chain Stage 2s to put Pokémon to the Lost Zone with Hurl into Darkness, so you just throw a Gengar into the Lost Zone and then mostly use Mew Prime to do your attacking until you could set up multiple Gengars on the bench. This made it a lot easier to pull up the strategy, even if it was unreliable. Maybe Mew's best deck, though, would come at the 2012 World Championships, maybe the most unlikely of places considering all the bench damage going around, but Mew paired great with the Aselgore lock deck. The goal of Aselgore was to use its attack to paralyze the opponent and then poison them, and then shuffle Aselgore into the deck. Of course, setting up Aselgore over and over though was very difficult, so why don't we just use Mew Prime to copy the attack, so we can find Mew Prime every turn much easier. This was aided, of course, by Vile Plume to lock the opponent, meaning they couldn't play Switch cards and were trainer locked, and you'd use Pokémon like Chandelure with its Cursed Shadow ability to drop damage counters on your opponent's Pokémon while they were paralyzed. This formed a brutal lock deck that made it very far at both US Nationals and the World Championships, despite the field of big basics threatening to take it down before it could even get set up. Mew Prime does things that Mew do. They love copying attacks, but unfortunately it was not as good as maybe Mew EX or Mew VMAX. Despite that, Mew Prime still had a bunch of different decks that it saw playing, and I think it has an interesting competitive history to be told. Maybe the weirdest card that saw play from the set was the Elf Lithograph number 4. This is the fourth of the four Elf Lithographs, so it's really the only one that saw a lot of play. This was used for its effect that let you look at all your face-down prize cards. This could be used in mainly Durant decks, which needed all four Durant in play to maximize their mill, since its Devour attack did a mill on your opponent's deck for each Durant you had in play. Of course, then we need all four of them. How do we get them out of the prizes? By looking at our face-down prizes with Alf Lithograph, and then we could use the card Rotom from Undaunted, which should swap one of our prize cards for the top card of our deck. There we go, our Durant's out, and it's time to destroy your opponent with the Devour attack. Well, this card usually wouldn't be worth mentioning just for seeing play in this one deck. Durant really was the best deck of the first format it came out in, believe it or not, so it's worth mentioning because it was in a top deck. 
Lastly, let's talk about the only legend card in the set to be very good. And by very good, I mean very fringe, but it's very funny. There's a good story to this one. Uh, so Dialga and Palkia Legend had two attacks. One of them, choose one of your opponent's bench Pokemon and put that Pokemon and all cards attached into your opponent's hand. This attack wasn't very good. However, its other attack was much more interesting. The time control attack discarded all metal energy attached to Palkia and Dialga Legend, and then added the top two cards of your opponent's deck to their prize cards. This was part of a very infamous troll deck called Prize Mill that would use Magnazone from Stormfront to reaccelerate the metal energy you discarded back onto your Palkia Dialga Legend. Floatzel GL Level X to mean you got your water Pokemon, which included Palkia Dialga Legend, back into your hand when they were knocked out. And of course, just lots of looping of time control. This Magnazone, Floatzel, and Legend strategy could play on offense as well, since you still played Magnazone, of course. But mainly, it's infamous for being able to mill your opponent's deck by adding their top cards of their deck into the prize cards, creating the very infamous 21 prize card image, where this card went off against a poor Feraligator Prime deck. And that's all we have for Triumphant. There's a couple of cards that saw tiny bins of fringe play, but I tried to stay away from those, besides a few interesting ones like Marowak and Ditto and Binette. Besides that, this set is definitely heavily weighed towards the end of the set, with some of the best trainer cards and Pokemon Prime of its entire era. Thanks for listening to me talk about one of my favorite sets of all time, and let me know in the comments what set you want me to talk about next time.